Can you imagine what it was like in their boardroom? You know, when they reported that their one <laughs> music store kicked their competitor's ass? And their competitors have like 300 stores. Uh, Toby, you're a tech guy. Uh, uh, what do you think of Sweetwater? Love Sweetwater. In fact, it's pretty much where I buy almost all of my tech gear for my studio. Good. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because it's almost like we set it up this way so we could get into <laughs> News of the Week. What a coincidence that we're talking about Sweetwater in the News of the Week. I love the story. Uh, I mean, this is unbelievable. I, I mean, how you can have a single, uh, a small business that has over 1.57 billion in annual sales and growing is just, is just incredible to me. I mean, think and about they, this. And they literally, they literally owe it all to YouTubers and podcasters. Right. I mean, it's such a fascinating style. I mean, look, can you... Uh, they kick all their competitors' asses. I mean, can you imagine what it, what it was like in their boardroom when it was reported that their one solo music store kicked their competitors' ass? Knowing that they're better to have something like 300 stores all throughout the country, it's insane. I mean, it's outrageous. I mean, but it, ultimately, here's, here's how they did it. What I find fascinating when you read the article, we'll put the link in the show notes, is yeah. there, there are several things. First of all, they're very data smart. By the way, smart. all of them are applicable to small business owners as well. Right. I mean, uh, well, ultimately, that, that's the lesson. Because here's a business yeah. that isn't trying to be cheap-ass by hiring the cheapest sales staff. So that they, they drive an outrageous amount of, again, over a billion in revenue via this one location. And ultimately, how they've done it is, well, it's gone viral. I definitely want to get your perspective perspective but they've used data smart but what's even smarter i think tova is who they hire or rather yeah who they don't hire mm, yeah very good point yeah they hire really intelligent audio visual engineers who know their shit so when people like me call up who doesn't know their shit <laughs> they don't just follow some sales script they can actually give me really great advice and they remember me when I call them back. They're, they're, I don't know what CRM system they use, Dan, but th it is brilliant because I will, I will call them and it hadn't been eight months and they will pick up the conversation. Oh, last time I remember talking to you. Last time we were talking about this. How's that going for you? And they gate, engage me in conversation. It is like, even if you don't buy tech gear, Dan, I think every company that has a small business should call up and order something from Sweetwater multiple times just to learn how they build their relationships and trust with their customer base. It's insane. So, so the, the, the lessons here, I think, Tova, are twofold. Number one, they've clearly got their processes dialed down. You know, the fact that they, they – how do you develop systems and processes so you can track the relevant information? You know, you can – so so that they can pick up the conversation, so that they know what you ordered. So it's not – it's not that you're speaking to some idiot that doesn't know the products. Uh, so I'm kind of conflating because that tracking all the data is one thing. But secondly, it's also people talk about, oh, um, how do we grow our sales when they should be thinking about who is going to grow our sales? And a, a massive mistake over that I see made over time is people are trying to be as cheap as possible. They're, they're uh, penny wise and pound foolish. They go, oh, we only want to pay the lowest salaries. How do we keep this cost down? Yeah. Whereas what Sweetwater do is they've hired, I think it's something like 600 sound engineers. So these are not minimum wage employees, but, but of course, they're able to do exactly what you said. They can connect to the customer, which ultimately means, Tofa, people like you, you know, the tech geeks, the people that are going to not only buy the most expensive stuff, the, the best stuff, but they're also going to come back again and again and again because they get the service, right? Well, here's, here's something interesting. And this is, I don't know if this is a technique or if, or if it's just because they hire people who really love the business, but I, I don't, I can't, you, you just talked about buying the most expensive stuff. I, I, I bet if I went back and I looked through, they actually discourage me at least half the time from buying the most expensive gear. They're like, yeah, you're just buying, you don't need that. You, you'd be better off with this. And I feel so ingratiated that they're saving me money while I'm spending an insane amount of money with their company, but it builds up that trust even more. Like I kind of get the impression that all of their engineers are like 50 and 60 year old musicians that have 
just gotten sick of being on the road performing at bars and now they just love being able to hang out at their house with a headset on and talk shop well it's such an ingenious way and you use the key word for me there Topher, which i think everybody listening is how do you instill trust because that has value i mean it was a book of the week a while ago you know speed of trust i think it's from 2015 yeah. stephen covey jr wrote that book which is Trust can be measured. It can be quantified. It has it has genuine commercial value, right? Uh, because ultimately, people who trust, like you do with Sweetwater, buy more quickly. They buy in higher quantities. They come back more often, and of course, they refer other people. Which, by the way, that that trust is is uh, the antithesis of, of this week's fail of the week. Oh. Uh- I tell you what, uh, what a great contrast to go from what Sweetwater's done to what Huel has done. Now, Huel, for disclosure, for, for those who don't know, Huel is a, uh, I'm going to say a meal replacement company. And it's yeah, it, it's yeah. had rapid growth. I don't know how long it's been in the UK. But for disclosure, I'm a customer of Huel. I'm not I'm not a shareholder. But uh, well, I, I consume this too, product. By the way. Yeah. Yeah, great. I mean, because ultimately, it's a, it's a plant-based uh, meal replacement, easy, on the go, so for f- busy people, including entrepreneurs, it's like, yeah, great, a shake of this stuff. It kind of replaces the, the Slim Fast from 20 years ago, you know, a shake for breakfast, a shake for lunch, right. and a proper dinner. But it's not marketed It's not marketed as weight loss. It's just marketed as a healthy meal replacement. But here's where where they're getting significant heat, uh, that, that ads were actually banned for mis- for misleading food savings, um, uh, the Advertising Standards Authority said that that ads were misleading because they were marketing on the current narrative, you know, cost of living, et cetera, et cetera. They marketed specifically that fuel helps keep money in your pockets and that a month's worth of food was less than 50 pounds, right? So yeah. they, they were specifically playing to that narrative. You know what I think is important there, by the way, is the term misleading because it, none of it was factually incorrect. And I think this is where a lot of times small business owners that are always trying to get that competitive edge in the marketing is there's this very gray line between what is misleading versus what is true. Like it's just so easy for business owners to go, we're not lying, but they've twisted the numbers and such. In fact, it, you know what? It kind of reminds me of our book of the week for next week's podcast, right? How's that for a tease? You want to listen to next week as well, because it's just so easy to twist the data and twist the numbers in such a way where you can kind of ethically go, I'm not lying. We're being honest. Right, right. I mean, not the, the... being upfront. Well, and this is where it gets interesting, right? Because if you read the particulars of the ad, which we'll put the link for those that want to geek out on what they said, how much she was saving and what it actually costs and why the right. ASA said, no, this ad is banned because it's misleading. I, I can see both sides of the equation. And it reminds me, Topher, of kind of myself 10 years ago. I can kind of understand, right? So yeah. I I think a lot of people are thinking, especially when they're trying to grow their business and when they're a private equity kind of funded companies such as I believe Huel is, is that they're after this significant growth. So it's like, how do we grow? How do we grow? How do we market? What's the angle? And yeah. for me, I remember 10 years ago, Topher, um, I, I used to um, uh, serve a very different avatar with my training business, with the mastermind business. Yeah. And I, 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 it was difficult for me because these days we only have established business owners, Right. And we only have established business owners and people that are a million plus in revenue. Yeah. But yeah. For my own point in clarity, they're not all a million plus. That That's that's the bar. There are some yeah. exceptions to the rule. Yeah. But those people have higher margins than some of the million dollar companies you have as well. So it's understandable. Right. Right. So so the point being that they're, they're much larger um, and established and consequently they stay longer. But but. 10 years ago, or maybe 15, you know, I've been in this game for maybe 15 years. um, It it was more, I believe that the product was good. And I think it was, it's not as good as it is now, but it was good. But effectively, that's probably because now I'm with you. (laughs) Joke of the week. (laughs) So, so, so so the, the, the uh, the point being that we we would work with startups, we would work with anybody. In hindsight, it was kind of like, Hey, if you liked it and you had the money to be able to pay for the program, then great, you could get in. And truthfully, I, I kind of distanced myself from the fact that knowing that some people were going to do less well, some people might have had bad business ideas, but I kind of went, well, who am I to say? I justified it to myself as well. 
who am I to say that they couldn't make it work, right? If they want to go for it, great. Yeah, I, I, it might even be, I, I don't know. By the way, I'm not judging you at all on this one because I'm guilty of doing the same thing as well. And I think most small business owners are, right? Like we have our impression of what our ideal customer is. And that's all we want to work with. But then we compare that to our accounts payable, <laughs> right? right? And we go, oh, you know, I, like how many times you've done it, I've done it. Anybody listening to this podcast or watching is probably guilty of it where we go, that's not my ideal customer but it's going to pay the bills. And, and right. so here's right. what I want to do. I want to ask you, what advice would you give to small business owners that still battle with that? And then I'll share with you kind of my theory on that as well. Because I want to know, what is, what is a key strategy that you recommend to help business owners get out of that curse of comparing payables to quality of leads? Well, here's the dichotomy, right? Those listening to this know this, if they've not had this story firsthand, they know it secondhand from people that they know that have succeeded or got to a certain point. The irony is uh, when you've made it and therefore you're, more, you're happy to turn customers away, you're happy to say, no, you're not a good fit, you're not right for us right now. Um, the irony is you get more, a higher volume of the ideal clients, right? So it's like, you know, when you don't need the money, Right, all of a sudden it changes. So my shift, though, for my shift in this business, because I've got multiple businesses, but in this particular training business, uh, uh, my shift to working with these more established businesses happened after I had a seven-figure exit, right? Uh, back mm -hmm. in 2000, uh, 2012, 13, uh, yeah. 10 ish years ago. So, so the the uh, and that's when I had the confidence to be able to make the shift. And then, of course, what mm -hmm. happened was the business exploded. Right, the, the the business exploded and grew rapidly, and the caliber of clients grew rapidly because it didn't it didn't eek of desperation. So, you know, to answer your question specifically, Topher, for those that are still there, going, oh yeah, but I've still got bills to pay. Yeah, uh, and I'm I'm not sure I've got a better answer. That so I'll be curious what you say. Other than um, you've got to be brave enough to take the stands and take the leap because yeah. uh, you'll find very quickly that you'll you'll be rewarded for it. Yeah, uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. It takes courage to do that. Here's, here's my strategy, and it almost complements you as a fail safe if you don't have that courage. Because I, I don't know if it's courage or self-discipline, but I will tell you that um, it's very hard for me to say no. I'm just like, I know I shouldn't. So here's, here's my thinking. And again, this kind of boils down to when all you have is a hammer, you see everything as a nail because I'm such a pitch guy. I, but I, will, right. I stand by this, that if your pitch isn't, shit hot and really specific about who your ideal client is, you're going to attract a wide variety of stuff that may not be there. But the more specific you are in your pitch about who you work with, the more it will turn off those people that you don't want to work with. I, I, I always go back to this notion that if your pitch isn't repellent enough to turn off your C, D, and E level prospects, it's not going to be strong enough to turn on your A, B level prospects. Yeah, I think that's good. Actually, I think I think that's very complimentary. Those two, th those things fit together hand in hand. And, and another lesson, by the way, that dovetails in this, that just digging this out of my memory is you and I have both got a mutual friend in uh, Jarek Robbins, a uh, uh, phenomenal kind of personal development trainer. I remember a long time ago, probably again nearly fifteen years ago, um, he uh, taught me the rule of five. Are you familiar with this rule? I'm sure I've heard of it, but uh, I don't remember it consciously. And that's not even pre-created uh, dialogue for the podcast. I genuinely don't remember. So let me hear him. Off uh, the top, real value being added. You remember all five. <laughs> no, uh, real value being created right now. So this is applicable for anybody that's, um, it, this is about pricing, how you price and position yourself and price testing and specifically the psychology of getting comfortable with it. So Jarek's attitude was, look, I'm going to get, uh, and he was in a coaching business, but I'm going to have five clients at a particular price point, and then I'm going to inch the prices up just a little bit. So in other words, he says, rather than like people periodically every few years have a big price hike, he was like frequently regular increases for the new clients, he might grandfather in the old ones. And so he said it works at many levels because it only goes up. I think it was 5%. He was nudging it up by so not a significant right. amount, but you got more comfortable having the higher prices, but of course it occurred more frequently. But then he said you, you use it from a sales perspective. Say, hey, Topher, look, just, you know, X is my price today. Whatever that is, £10, £100, £1,000, whatever. X is my price today. 
And uh, but I've only got two more spots left at this, and then it's going up to from 100 to 110. And and what that would mean is then that that kind of scarcity or that genuine scarcity would cause people to be more likely to make a buying decision and make it sooner, which of course then meant that you had the five clients at that level. And then, of course, you started, it was only a fraction higher. And then, of course, you didn't have that long to go before you're, you're only two or three away from the next price hike. Interesting. And so, so uh, he I, said, get five clients and then raise. Five clients raise. Is that what you're saying? Correct. That's exactly it. Rule of That's five. Kid. Yeah. Well, for me, I, it was really helpful for me back then because it was a simple, you, you can argue it in other businesses as well, just with different numbers, not five. This is a service-based business, right? And it could be five, it could be 50, but it's, the point is regular incremental price increases. So you're not burning yourself because if the price goes up from 100 to 105 or whatever, it's not going to suddenly cause sales to completely stop, right? But it right. psychologically gets over a bit of the imposter syndrome. And uh, so that was a that was a side note. And now I can't remember where we were in the podcast. Uh, you know what? That's okay. Because last week I was all over the place. And this week I had a great night's rest. I'm ready to go. So I know exactly where we're at, which is to talk about our promotion of the week, which is going to be, and by the way, it's better that I remember and you don't, your CEO mastermind coming up March 29th and 30th. Uh, at the time of this recording, we still have a few talking about uh, scarcity. We have still have, I believe, three or four of the guest spots available. Um, now, by the time this gets published, we may not. I don't know. But by all means, if you uh, – there's two things I want to say here. Number one, check out your website at danbradbury.com forward slash me because that stands for Mastermind Experience. If you want to hang out with about 60 kick-ass entrepreneurs, sharing best practices, finding new clients, new joint ventures, the, 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 the limits, uh, um, the potential is unlimited there. But I do want to say this. What's great about your mastermind is that it's also a place to get contrary, uh, contrary opinion and thought. Like people push back all the time to kind of right. stress test your theories. And I could just as easily stress test Jarek's theory of going, you don't want to incrementally raise it to where you don't lose people. Because one of my best advice that I ever got from somebody once was that the reason why you raise your rates is to actually lose customers. If you don't lose customers when you raise your rates, you didn't raise them enough. And I always like that theory as well. Hmm. So your mastermind experience is a great place where people will always push back and stress test things. And we've got it coming up March 29th and 30th. If you want to check it out or well, listen, by the way, I, you, go faster. What's, uh, what's Gabriella's email? Uh, it's Gabriella at danbradbury.com. Yeah, well, there you go. I probably could probably could have figured it's that amazing. one out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So email her to find out if there's any um, guest spots available. Oh, by the way, guest spots doesn't mean free. So don't be a cheap ass. You're still going to be paying for this program. Because there's good value in it. Yeah, anyway, look, I, I, the, 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 I'm so excited for this event, Tofa, because it's going to be our best one yet. I mean, it's mm -hmm. hard to uh, top the billionaire that we had at the uh, December event, but I think you've done it. I think uh, all the Thank details, you. so we don't so we don't wax too lyrical about, uh, on this. There's a video going into uh, all the different topics at danbury.com forward slash me. That's M-E, short for Mastermind Experience. Uh, go and watch the video. You'll see that we have just a world leader and a lot of people use the term like world leader world expert but this is this is somebody that is a senior exec at one of the biggest companies in the world talking about artificial intelligence it's yeah. um yeah yeah like, by the way, just go and I, check it out i can't tell you how many times i've had conversations with this guy where literally my jaw just drops open because the man is just brilliant on it by the way this is also a brilliant segue into our hero of the week, who is one of your clients at the mastermind. And I think because we're talking about your mastermind, we should really talk about why she's your hero specifically because of what she did when she joined, left, and then came back. Yeah. So, so I mean, look, uh, uh, so the hero of the week this week is Lisa Carson. Lisa Ker Carson of Dynamic Dogs. I'll be at the website at labradoodles.co.uk. Link in the show notes. Yep. And, and, and so uh, Lisa's uh, uh, business, which has multiple businesses, but she um, uh, breeds and trains uh, dogs for, uh, for specific families and specific needs worldwide. So she's definitely a, a premium provider. And I know I have one of her dogs, one of her beautiful dogs. I was dogs. just going to say, we failed miserably. We should be having your dog in the studio so you could brag about what an awesome dog Millie is. 
Well, well, uh, uh, I could, but my partner uh, would laugh at me for this because she is in love with my dog much more so than I. And yes. I would also say that she and you would have a, a love fest over dogs. And I'm not quite as strong in kind. I like dogs, just not so much that I sleep with them curled up every night, Topher. Right. Uh, and, and that's a flaw in you and your characteristic, <laughs> but I'm still going to, I'm still going to let you be my friend, but just know... Well, as your flaws, that's one of your bigger ones. Well, wait, wait, here's, here's the point to get to get back on track. You know, uh, I remember Lisa and I having another conversation, which was if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room, right? So if you look mm. back up to just talking about uh, the CEO mastermind coming up, it, it's there are multiple people in that room that have got multi seven figure profits, right? So, so uh, if you aspire to get that level, you want to get in that room. And that's what Lisa did. And she joined the program. And, you know, a very complicated business because there's a lot of compliance in her business. There's a lot of things oh, that have imagine, to go right. Yeah. The timing, the, the gestation periods, how many puppies, they've got to be healthy. You know, right? all these things that are essential, critical. So it's yeah. a t tough business to make work. And uh, she, she joined the program and made significantly more profits. Uh, I, I won't spare the profits that she was making because I haven't explicitly asked her permission. What we do have a permission to share is... She, she significantly ramped up, was making great money. Um, and she thought, you know what? I've got this nailed now. And she stepped mm -hmm. out of the program. And, you know, uh, clearly I was like, no, Lisa, you should renew. But that's self-serving. So she went down, yeah. you know. Uh, but what happened was she, she uh, you know, uh, two years later, she comes back with her tail between her legs, pun intended. There you go. What do you think? <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah, so, uh, uh, cheesy talk show uh, uh, pun. Um, and she said, look, leaving this program has cost me over half a million pounds. Yeah. Um, because, uh, and here's, here's the important bit, if you're listening right now. I think she left because she was like, I've got the ideas. I now know what I'm doing, right? I know what I'm doing, so I'm stuck with this. I'm not going to do new stuff. I just need to run with this. Uh, um, I like. I don't need more ideas, but that's not the bloody point of the mastermind, right? It's yeah, not about exactly giving you right. more entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah. the, 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 one of the very large values, which is often overrated. So, if you're listening to this right now, think about what happens in you know wherever you get your learning from. It's like, do you have anybody to tell you no? Do you have anybody to say, calm the down? That's a stupid ass idea. Yeah. And uh, Lisa had got carried away with herself because she and I used to regularly just fight over some of the things that she wanted to do. And I think the mastermind act is a little bit of a break, you know, mm -hmm. because we could concede on the good ideas, but we'd not that we could veto. It's her business, but veto the bad ideas. And we'd fight about it enough that she'd be willing to go, OK, you know what? I'm around a smart bunch of entrepreneurs, some of the fastest growing businesses in the UK right now. And in yep. If the vast majority of them are saying, this is a horrendous idea, do not do it, maybe I should think twice. Standard rule of thumb. If you don't have at least 10 people in your network that say, I disagree, you're stupid, what about this or what about that? You're missing the mark because those are some of the most valuable conversations you can have. So, uh, by the way, I uh, love her story. I love the fact, but I think what makes her the hero is twofold. Number one, that she had the presence of mind to come back. A lot of people might have right. had too much ego tapped into it and go, oh, ego, it's right, correct. Minute, right? She has no ego. She's like this egoless person, but also she's incredibly open mind. Like, like she, I, honest to God, out of all of the people in your mastermind, I think she's the biggest sponge. And I mean that like in such a complimentary way, like she takes tons of notes. She's there to just absorb and soak and really learn. And she's just incredible. By the way, fun fact, do you know what they call uh, golden doodles in Australia? I do. I do not. Oh, uh, 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 yeah, I do. What is it? Uh, uh, well, no, I was going to say uh, um, uh, a labradoodle in Australia. I believe it's called a cover dog. It is called a cover dog. And I did not know why until I met Lisa. Do you know why it's called a cover dog? I do not know that. Because doodle in Australia is nicknamed for a penis. So nobody wants to own a pet and say, ah, I've got a golden penis. So they had to call them copper dogs because they couldn't sell. Ah, I understand. And that, that uh, right, right there is, is informative at so many levels. 
<laughs> that's that's helpful. I was going to say, I, I now understand why she's got labradoodles.co.uk, not labradoodles.com yes. or, or, or .au. .au. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's 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 move on. Let's talk about the book of the week, my friend. So uh, Dan Airely, is that how you pronounce it? I have no clue. Airely? It's a weird name. Airely? But, Air- I don't know. Uh, 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 but... But the book, the book is great, and it's predictably irrational. Predictably irrational, which is about the hidden forces that shape our decisions. So, yeah, I mean, I know, I know I've got my two cents, but what, what, what were your favorite takeaways from this book, Sofa? Yeah, I think, th- I think what I, first off, I love behavioral economics. In fact, I got a question for you because, like, I find myself going through waves. Like, if you would have talked to me five years ago, my favorite things to book read, uh, favorite books to read would have been about like, um, uh, city development and urban planning for some reason. I just love that stuff. I've been on a kick now for about the past two years, maybe three, soaking up and loving books on behavioral economics, which is how people make decisions about money. And this book is probably one of the best. In fact, I'd say the only book I would rank higher than this one would be Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, also because it's probably one of my top five books of all time. But the big takeaway that I got- as well. Yeah, anyway. the big takeaway, I would hold on to that thought then because I want to hear it because I'll probably read it if I haven't already. But the big takeaway for me in that book was that um, he points out how business owners often will set pricing based upon what makes sense. But what he points and he argues it very well is how people don't make decisions, especially about money, based upon what makes sense. It's completely irrational. And he shows the patterns for what those irrational decision points are. And I freaking love it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do love it. I, I mean, my favorite chapter from this book, if I remember rightly, and I must have read this again more than 10 years ago now, but it, it is the cost of free, the cost of free. Mm, so yes. I love how there's so many examples that are counterintuitive. And what, what hits home for me so far, why this book is well worth, it's well worth picking up is yeah. it's, peer-reviewed data, right? It's not just that I've got some theory or I've seen this work in my in my, uh, like in my showroom and I've now got a good sales pitch. I, I can argue my case as to why this might work and somebody naively goes, oh yeah, that's good. I'll change my whole business based upon that. And then it destroys it because it actually yeah. doesn't work in reality. It's just a, it's just a theory. It's like yeah. peer-reviewed data that proves that this is how human beings are weird, right? We behave in strange and irrational ways. Hence, and and it's predictable, hence, hence, hence the title. So uh, th- that chapter of that book made me really shift about, uh, well, fundamentally, Geoffrey, stop me doing things for free. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's fantastic text. Uh, uh, here, would be, here would be my challenge for anybody listening or watching this podcast. I would say, get the book, read it, and implement just one thing from that book, and you will pay for that book a thousand times over. That's, that's my safe prediction. Yes, definitely, de- definitely, definitely wants to add to the list. Definitely wants yeah. to add to the list. All right, let's let's wrap it up with a cool quote of the week, my friend. All right, so this is from uh, Mark Hunter, who wrote uh, uh, another good book called "A Mind for Sale," uh, "A Mind for Sales," and uh, his quote is: "It's not about having the right opportunities; it's about handling the opportunities right." Yeah, brilliantly well said. By the way, if you have ever have you ever seen his demo video, go to his website. It's not. honest to God. I think he, uh, first off, I think he's got great ideas, right? I really enjoy his stuff. It's the longest demo reel I've ever seen for a speaker. It's just kind of like, no, put your, put your checkbook down. I'm not done talking yet. And it just goes on forever and ever. So that's my. That, that's my that doesn't sound like a good there. sales good. pitch, but, it, but it's. I'm it's, telling you though, but I will say this, it's good. It's informative, but the guy's got some brilliant stuff and I really love that thought. I love it. Well, and as always, Tova, well, I love the contrarian ideas in this podcast, and it sometimes conflicts, right? Like, if it yeah. was easy, uh, your competition would have figured it out uh, yeah. uh, already. That's why we're here to do the, well, we're not here to do the thinking for you, the listener, but that's why we're here doing the thinking and hopefully simulating you to ask different questions, uh, different angles, different persp- perspectives. If you want a different result, you've got to think differently or said in another way. If you want a better business, you need to be a better business owner. Well said, my friend. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Three things you need to do now. Number one, make sure you subscribe to this podcast so you do not miss an episode. Also, get on over to Amazon to get a copy of my latest book, Turnover is Vanity, Profit is Sanity, Nine and a Half Steps to Improving Your Profits and Cash Flow. Also, join our Facebook group, 
The turnover is vanity, profit is sanity in the community to connect with other business owners.